Hello, everybody, and welcome. Hi. Um, I'll send around uh, a sign-up sheet if you could just fill out um, who you are and that you're here. Um, I, as probably most of you know, am Jeremy, uh, director of the Honors Program. So nice to see you here on Thursday night. Um, I am going to introduce our guest speakers for the evening and uh, then broadly make myself scarce. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to be doing this event. Um, I will, Laura has my copy of the graphic novel. Can you hold it up? Yeah. So um, <laughs> the thing about uh, this graphic novel uh, by uh, distinguished artist Sophia Warren, who's here to come with us tonight, her first novel. Uh, it is a rip-roaring good read. It also is like, for me, very personal, because I live in the neighborhood. Um, I was a volunteer um, for that campaign. I was like living through many of those events. So it's very cool to just read a little bit, sort of your own life process artistically. Um, it also is, like uh, I think, a really interesting exploration about what it means for a person of, as it were, artistic bent to get involved politically in a time where it seems necessary to be involved politically. So I'm super excited um, for Sophia. And then I also have the pleasure um, to introduce uh, Senator Julia Salazar. Um, and welcome to her this evening. Um, the book has her face on the cover, so <laughs> you might have a sense. Um, and you know, the book, uh, for those who didn't, uh, Sophia's gonna tell us a lot about it, but in brief, um, Julia was elected to represent uh, the 18th district, um, which is uh, where I live, Bushwick, and uh, also where maybe some of you live, um, uh, and also um, Williamsburg, uh, the Cypress Hills, um, a little bit of East New York, uh, am I forgetting? That's, that's pretty yeah. much, yeah. Yeah, it's, cha it's changed because of redistricting, but all of those things are still true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she was elected in 2018. Um, now five years in office in a primary against sort of an establishment uh, Democrat. Um, she uh, campaigned primarily on tenants' rights and has now been in the state Senate for five years where she's fought, um, among other things, for tenants' rights and the uh, raft of legislation passed in 2019, which is part of the, what the novel is all about, um, her first year in office. And, uh, and uh, she's also now currently chair of the Crime and Corrections Committee where she works on criminal legal reform and uh, fighting against mass incarceration in the state. So really two exciting people to have with us. I'm so thrilled to hear what they have to say. I feel intimidated sitting in this chair next to them, um, but uh, I'm, hence I'll like slink away and let them talk. So let's give them a round of applause.
came from the fact that I also, in 2018, when I started, was living in the Bushwick area. I was technically in Ridgewood, which is one block over. Does anybody here live in that area? Bushwick, Coysburg? Cool. Um, so in 2018, when this book starts, um, I was reading headlines. I was feeling aggrieved about politics. But I was not necessarily sustainably involved in politics in any meaningful way or in organizing activism. And it was something that was really a source of tension for me. It felt like I was, I had all these ambitions about what kind of life to lead and how involved to be, but it just kind of wasn't coming to fruition. I found myself spending more time just kind of trying to make rent and figure out how to animate. Um, and it was a point of frustration. Also around this time, these posters started showing up everywhere in my neighborhood uh, because Julia was running for state senate. And it was this really vibrant campaign, super visible in the neighborhood, lots of people out, young folks, older folks. Um, it was really impossible to be a part of that neighborhood and not notice this political activity. And for me, it was really motivating and it made me really curious because I was sort of like, who are all of these people who seem to know all about state politics? I don't know anything about state politics. What am I missing? <laughs> um, and I was also really curious about Julia. We were the same age. I was seeing her face everywhere. I felt a certain kinship to her more than I did for other politicians. Um, and she was running this grassroots campaign as a democratic socialist, something that I was also really curious about, but kind of unsure how to move forward with. So. Uh, this is kind of where things begin, and it's this, this part of the narrative is in the book. Um, when Julia won her primary, which was in the summer, um, I decided to reach out and see if it was possible for me to follow her around uh, and make this book. So I sent an email to her campaign, not really knowing what to expect, and then within a matter of hours, a response back. They were in fact interested in running a cartoonist in bed with them. So that's how this all got started. And this is kind of our first interaction. Maybe you remember this, Julia. Um, <laughs> when <laughs> we met at a coffee shop, and I was expecting to have to do more legwork to convince you that this was a project worth doing to let me kind of just have full creative control of this project and really just sit around wherever they were for some length of time. Um, but it really did not take any convincing at all. It was a quite easy conversation. Um, and we kind of just took it from there. So what ended up happening over the course of this year is that I spent as much time as I could both in the state senate office in the district, um, spent some time in Albany in that office, and also on the ground with different facets of the people that were a part of the legislation and the organizing around that legislation that year. So a lot of that in this book has to do with tenants' rights. This was a big package that was up at the end of that legislative year. It was something that Julia and a lot of other people had convened on. It was a big, vibrant coalition of people working towards this bill. So I wanted to spend time as much in the office with the people around it to kind of get a sense of the fuller picture of what it means to be a movement politician, right? To be not just yourself, but to be accountable to this much larger structure. What does it actually look like when it interacts with government? Um, so in that way, the book is structured in a way that tries to incorporate not just Julia as the main character, but all the people around her, um, which was definitely a narrative challenge because in some ways, the easiest thing to do with a narrative is to kind of limit the number of characters and have one main character who is accomplishing something. And in this case, it was a question of how to decentralize that to make it a story about kind of an ensemble cast and still have a narrative arc, to have energy, to have conflict. Um, so certainly something in the process that I was thinking a lot about. Uh, I got a chance to see a lot of things I had not seen, like Albany. Has anybody been to the state capitol before? If you haven't, it's crazy looking. It looks
looks kind of like an alien landscape. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's got sort of like Soviet alien energy. It's enormous. Um, so because this is a visual medium, I wanted to try and capture things like what it feels like to step out of a bus and suddenly be completely dwarfed by these like filing cabinet structures. Um, one of the things I feel really grateful about in this project is that from the beginning, everyone that I was uh, spending time with really understood the importance of me being an independent agent. So this was not like a creative collaboration between Julia and her staff and I. This was me spending time with them and then separate from them putting together this piece. Um, and the reason that that was important to me was that I think it it gives it more value as an independent voice as opposed to just seeming like kind of an organ, a propaganda organ of the office, right? I made my own conclusions based on my time with them. Um, and that meant building trust. So if you're a nonfiction person and you're interested in dealing with subjects, something we can certainly talk about. Um, it meant spending a lot of time there so that we felt comfortable enough around each other that moments that were not so great I could still be in the room for, and that no one was necessarily directly impacted by that, but we can talk about, we'll ask you maybe what that was like. Um, and that was important to include because this book, as I imagined it, was, was meant to show the reality of what it is to actually enter government with these great ambitions as a socialist. Julian can tell you more than I can, but uh, she was the only socialist in the legislature, right? So there's lots of questions about how do you work within a coalition as the leftmost pole? Is it isolating? Are you going to be causing friction? The answer is sometimes yes. Um, so the book kind of tries to balance moments like that where I'm kind of a fly on the wall with interactions like this, which are more kind of interview style. Um, because comics are visual, I didn't want to just have interviews. And when there are interviews, questions about how to make that still engaging on the page come up, right? Some of that for me is that I'm really interested in gesture. So in my process, I'm just going to do a lot of drawing people, sketching, getting a sense of how people move so that that could be some of the visual engagement on the page. But also, sometimes that meant, this is an interview I did with Ramon, who was an organizer in the office, um, who was explaining kind of in broader terms about organizing strategies. And so sometimes what that meant was grounding this conversation in the actual bar that we were sitting in, but also having the freedom to move into this visualization of what it is he's talking about. Um, so that was a decision that I made as I was structuring it to allow myself the freedom to not stick exclusively to things that I literally saw. That said, I did try and keep it very honest to the experience that I had. I took a notes, I was doing a lot of recordings, um, wanted to make sure that this was not just me making things up, and the last one it was pretty obvious that what I was doing was illustrating a broader concept. Uh, so this is spending more time in Albany with people who were not in Julia's office, but were part of the organizing of the tenants movement. Here's another scene that incorporates kind of figuring out how to visualize something. In this case, that something is stress. <laughs> this was kind of a tense meeting that we had around April. Um, this was just after budget season, which is starting to happen now again, a very tense and busy time for people who are in office. Um, and this was a staff meeting where there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot at stake as far as the bill that, that we were, that the office was, was trying to pass. And people had different opinions about how to make that happen. And again, important from my perspective to include these things in the book, both because it's honest and because it offers some sort of dramatic tension. So reading the book as a story. And I'll just kind of move past these quickly. These are just some other examples of, of ways that I was thinking visually about laying out this page um, and moving around from different characters and getting different primary source. This is a narrative that came from C.A. Weaver, who was one of the organizers about what it was like towards the end of this 
legislative push to get a call from Andrew Cuomo, who was the governor at the time, is kind of the antagonist figure in this book. Um, <laughs> maybe you saw him in an earlier spread as like a big looming balloon. Um, <laughs> so Sierra gets this very intimidating call from the governor at this very crucial point in the organizing, and she makes this uh, pretty stressed out decision <laughs> to to not kind of negotiate with him at all, which had a big payoff. Um, another spread. We can talk about um, the ways that I decided to let, like the design decisions I made to try and make this book more legible and easy to read. One of them was, for example, at the beginning of each chapter. I would do a script like this with two pages. Um, and that's it for the pages. And I have some more. This is just an example <laughs> of some of what I was doing at the time while I was sitting in on all these meetings and things like that, which is to have a sketchbook with me. Maybe some of you are also chronic sketchers. I suspect the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> Vigor is head gosh. <laughs> yeah, so for me, it served a couple of purposes. And one of them was, as I said, to get a sense of gesture. It really grounded me in kind of observation as I was there. Um, some of you who doodle in class might also relate to the idea that it it made it kind of easier for me to focus sometimes on what people were saying. This was a lot of information I did not know, so I was trying to figure out ways to really focus my attention in various ways. Um, but also, to be totally honest, it just gave me something to do, which um, can be something that, in my experience, maybe more can feel sort of daunting, right? If you're showing up to a new space, it can be nice to kind of have a task or an activity, so you're not just like hanging around. Um, so that was also really useful for me that I could be like, I'm the one who draws. That's why I'm here. Um, we can talk, if it's of interest, about more of this is the sense of the layout. I won't get into this right now, but it is here if you want to see more kind of rough process stuff. Um, but I think maybe it makes sense to move over so we give Julia an opportunity to talk. And maybe if that up to you guys, please stand into that sound okay. Um, so, Julia, maybe you could just introduce yourself a little bit and talk about your experience briefly from 2018 to now, what the differences are. Yeah. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, really, it's a, an honor and a joy for me to be here with you tonight. Um, I'm Julia Salazar, and um, as both Jeremy and Sophia mentioned, um, I'm a Democratic Socialist. I am um, a state senator in neighborhoods, uh, representing neighborhoods in North and East Brooklyn, as well as now um, a small part of Queens in Ridgewood. Um, I, uh, sorry, yes, I'm introducing my, myself. Um, and what has changed since 2018? Um, well, actually, I do want to mention, and perhaps it's obvious, but um, as you look at the images on the screen and, and um, hopefully um, read the graphic memoir that Sophia wrote, um, this all took place um, in 2018 to 2019 before the pandemic. So mm -hmm. it's not for aesthetic purposes that no one is wearing masks <laughs> or, um, you know, um, uh, complying with <laughs> what are now public health norms. <laughs> um, Very good point. That is just, just to be totally clear. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah, uh, I ran in 2018. I did not expect to run for office, not then, not ever. Um, I was a community organizer um, working in a, um, a large like citywide coalition focused on police accountability, working with families um, of people who had been killed or brutalized by the police um, and often was antagonizing elected officials. Um, just trying to get them to do what we feel is is the right thing um and so when however i i did some like volunteer organizing on um socialist campaigns um starting with uh senator bernie sanders when he ran for president in 2016 um and uh and then also for um socialists running for city council um and locally and actually a um 
housing organizer who ran um, also also a Latina working class um, person from the community that I now represent and named Debbie Medina, who ran as Democratic Socialist in 2018, but before the presidential election that activated a lot of people to become more involved in politics, also um, really sparked enormous growth in the political organization that I belong to, the Democratic Socialist of America. Um, so all of this was important context for me, for my political development, and also my um, relationship to local politics. Uh, but early in 2018, um, I was approached by friends who I had organized with on um, Debbie Medina's campaign, actually, two years before. Um, spoiler, she didn't become the state senator. She and she had no interest in ever running again. She like moved away from the district, et cetera. But, um, but it was a very inspiring campaign. It was a grassroots campaign. Again, she ran openly as a democratic socialist, which was really um, radical at, at the time, um, uh, more so than in, in 2018 even, or rather in 2018, I guess. <laughs> Wait a minute, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so so um, uh, you're right, yeah. So uh, at any rate, she ran in 2016. Um, and so uh, two years passed quickly. At the time, um, Republicans had this like de facto majority in the state Senate. Um, there was actually a Democratic majority, but there was this Basically, there were these Democrats who entered into a power sharing agreement to caucus with the Republicans. It was called the Independent Democratic Conference or the IDC. Um, they basically were like turncoat Democrats who helped the Republicans maintain this majority and maintain control of the state Senate um, because otherwise we would have had a, a, de a nominally Democratic governor, Governor Cuomo. Um, a supermajority of Democrats in the state assembly and would have had a, um, a Democratic majority in the state Senate the way that we do now. Um, and they wanted to prevent that from happening. Um, and so they actually managed to hold up a lot of progressive, very important progressive legislation um, uh, for years, for many years. And then um, when I was approached in early 2018 about running, there were also other candidates who were running for the very first time, um, very progressive. They weren't socialists, but they were like we, you know, um, really were running on similar or the same policy platforms. Um, and uh, this was a moment when there was a lot of energy and, and interest um, and grassroots work going into trying to um, get rid of these uh, Democrats who had um, betrayed their constituents and betrayed New Yorkers by caucusing with Republicans. Um, the, so in early 2018, I'm approached by people who I had done some organizing with, um, and they said, someone needs to run against Dilan. Dilan was my state senator at the time. He had been in office for 26 years, um, I think 16 of them roughly in the state Senate. Um, and even though he was not technically a member of the IDC, of the, the turncoat Democrats, um, he like took money from this slush fund that they had. He was like very much okay with the Republicans maintaining a majority or, or, or rather maintaining control. Um, and he also most notably in a district like ours um, where we have seen um, really profound negative impacts of gentrification, um, a lot of people being displaced. Um, most notably, he had taken a ton of money, more than any sitting Democrat actually in, in New York State, um, from the real estate industry. And it was reflected in his votes and his actions um, and, and really seen by um, people in our community as a, as a betrayal of, of our community and the people that he was supposed to be fighting for and representing. So. Um, so a friend comes to me and says, someone needs to run against Dilan. And I said, yeah, someone needs to run against Dilan. Like I hadn't thought, I almost hadn't thought about it for two years, to be honest, because the work I was doing was local, um, related to, to policing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there wasn't a lot of interest in engaging with the state Senate because it felt so futile at the, at the time, right? um, because of the political dynamic. So he said, someone needs, needs to run against Dilan and, and you, it's you, you're the candidate. Um, and I said, absolutely not. Um, I, again, 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 actually, I, I said no. 
um, a few times um, to my friend and then everybody else who was, you know, conspiring with him <laughs> to try to um, to get me to run. Um, and I, you know, I uh, there are a lot of reasons why I didn't want to run. Um, I'm naturally introverted. Um, my, you know, again, my relationship to politics had been really um, uh, more as like, um, you know, antagonistic. Um, and I also just did not see myself um, as like a leader in a conventional sense, um, as having like a commanding presence, you know, nor did I see myself uh, for perhaps obvious reasons as like an old white man with a law degree, right? Because literally none of those things are true about me. <laughs> and that was my perception of, um, of uh, what it was to be a state senator, even though I probably wouldn't have said it out loud or really admitted it to myself, like that was, that was something that I was sort of reckoning with. And so I didn't think I could do it. Um, didn't think I could afford to quit my job. Um, but eventually, I was persuaded to um, because it was, again, 2018, and we knew that the following year, the rent laws were going to expire. Because at the time, um, the way that the legislature had set it up again and again and again was that every four years, the rent laws would be up for renewal. Um, and it would come very close to a total crisis for every, everyone in New York who lived in rent-regulated housing. Um, that the laws that protect people, keep people in their homes, um, protect them from, you know, no cause evictions um, would be, would, would suddenly, you know, expire. Um, and so looking at the rent laws expiring the following year, they said to me, you can't wait two years, because that was one thing I was saying. I said, okay, fine, like, I will consider doing this in two years, but I'm just not ready right now. I'm tw I'm, I was 27 years old, I just turned 27 and was like, look, I, I just feel totally unprepared to do this. I'm, the, I'm not the one. Um, and they said, if we don't have the right people, especially from this district, if we don't have the right people um, advocating for tenants in Albany and fighting for stronger rent laws, then um, it's, it could really have devastating consequences for renters and families um, across the city and, and even across the state. Um, the stakes were really high. And um, we just couldn't afford to wait two years. And that was what persuaded me. Um, but it was really like we had to hit the ground running because by the time I agreed to run and launched a campaign, it was actually April um, for a September primary. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was um, a very heavy lift. And um, there's so much more I could say, but I've been talking for a long time. Yeah. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just say, maybe we can open it up soon, but yeah. um, talking about your reluctance to run and being an introvert, I think one of the things that was so, can everyone still hear me? So interesting for me, who I, I also consider myself an introvert, um, it was so interesting to me to be able to see you in action once you were actually doing this job because it offered for me a really powerful new look at what it means to be a leader um, and I don't know that you will say this so I will say this because I was in the room with you so much especially during this introductory period and some of this is in the book um, it was it was really astounding to see that have such an impact on both for you personally going in and meeting with different people because a lot of what your job touches is senior centers, hospitals. I mean, there's a huge array that I didn't really have a good sense of, of what local government looks like and who it interacts with, right? So all these government uh, places in the district like senior centers, um, but then also community organizations, lots of groups of people um, who are already working in the district in various ways. And to hear people uh, get in touch with you and interact with you and feel so inspired and thankful to you for how much you were listening, that for me was really powerful because I also had this understanding that politicians and what it means to be a part of government and politics is to be this big blustery personality, right? That like, And in the same way I think that I first thought about organizing, right, is that the things that are really visible to us are charismatic leaders who are giving dynamic speeches, who are 
you know, like gesticulating and really natural in front of crowds. And there is so much going on that is not that, that is so affecting. Um, and there are lots of different ways to be commanding of a room if that's what you need to do. And it does not always mean taking up the most space. Um, so I really thank you for that because that was something that I didn't know was going to be a part of this dynamic. And, and it really was so important to me to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was, it's like been the honor of my life to get to be, um, to get to be in this role. Um, even though I, of course, didn't see myself as an elected official or as a candidate uh, before, I had always been, have, have always been very dedicated to public service um, and, and felt this, this call to public service um, in, its, in its different forms. Um, and to me, really the, the meaningful work of public service is often what is, what is unseen, unsexy, you know, what, what you're describing, um, it's, it is um, the conversations with everyday people, it's listening and it's allowing um, the needs of everyday working people to inform policy um, and to actually guide the decisions that we make as people in positions of power. Yeah. Yeah. And we can maybe get into what that actually looks like, but maybe Jeremy or other people, I don't want to take up too much space just talking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm fine maybe opening it up. I always have a thousand questions, but um, I'm kind of curious if there's already questioning bubbling up from this wonderful group of students, and then maybe I can pepper mine in as we go. Cool. Melinda? Um, uh, Hello, it's great to meet you back here. Um, similarly, I am a Latina of the working class background, and unfortunately, our community and groups like it tend to lack the social and political awareness that other groups have the luxury of having because our main priorities are just in daily survival. And so, how were you able to, like, your position kind of? pushing the message of like more leftist ideas in these communities that don't have the time to think of that, don't have the time to like be there and constantly changing policies that you set. Yeah. This is um tell me your name again. Melina. Melina? Yes. Um nice to meet you. Uh so what is really interesting about this campaign, this this com these communities, um to give a little bit, just a little bit more context, um, the district's like 330,000 people. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of people, um, but there also is this legacy and history in these neighborhoods, especially in Bushwick, which is the center of the district, but also in South Williamsburg and, um, and throughout these parts of Brooklyn um, of working class communities of color being very civically engaged and and so that like civic engagement long preceded preceded me um like even as a as a you know sentient human being <laughs> right <laughs> like um uh just for for examples um like make the road new york um which is now a national organization um has a history a very strong history in bushwick and is based in bushwick still um so organizing um, immigrant New Yorkers, um, people who, whose first language is not English, um, who are working to survive um, and saying like together, even though we, we don't have um, power from, from wealth or status um, or identity as you know, in, in this society, um, together, we have people power to be able to change things. And, and um, so that like legacy had made the conditions right for um, a grassroots campaign to actually um, bring people together who were not, who were organized already. Um, not just, again, not just Make the Road, but, but um, Los Ures, um based in, in Williamsburg. Um, uh, New York Communities for Change in their Bushwick chapter, 
um, these were groups that um, had just been so committed to political education and empowering people to, they had been fighting against Dulan for years, actually, my, my predecessor. Um, and so they were, you know, this campaign could not possibly have been successful, and I simply never would have run, to be honest, if the conditions were not um, in that way, like the grassroots con conditions, um, favorable and ready for um, a young democratic socialist to, to run and win. Because that was what we, we needed, right? When they say a, gra a grassroots campaign, I, I mean that like we didn't have, we didn't have wealth, um, we didn't have, uh, you know, still don't take any money from the for-profit real estate industry, um, certainly not from like the fossil fuel industry um, or corporations, um, which my opponent, um, like, like many in New York state politics, they have that in their favor and it's much easier for them to fundraise. Um, without that, we, we, needed, we needed our people, you know? That was the only way that we were going to win. Um, so yeah, and I think, but, but the last thing I'll just say about that is, um, you know, we live in a capitalist society, of course. This is not news to anyone here, um, <laughs> right? We live in a capitalist society and in, in which we are systematically alienated from one another. Um, and so it is really, in a sense, a radical act to go out and knock on people's doors and seek to have meaningful conversations with our neighbors, with total strangers, um, instead of going back to our, like, you know, getting in our little pods and going to our little pods and, like, um, back to our nuclear families and just, um, you know, focusing on ourselves. Rather, it's radical for us to care about other people so much that we would, um, that we would seek to have conversations with them and, and motivate them to change, to change the world, but but to change like all of our circumstances through electoral politics. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. Jessica. Um, hi. Um, it's just great to hear like the power and the people power happens. Um, I actually got a question. And uh, it's also like one of the projects I am doing now is to actually catch people's attention to decision making process. Because like people in um there's who like this like want to um, want to get their working class and they have so many problems in their life already. And then maybe the thing that we are running now is not their priority problems, but will, will really affect on their long-term interests or benefit them. But it's really hard for us to let people catch people's attention to actually say, hey, this is really important, even though I know you have so many problems. But this is really important. Can we join the meeting? Can we make a decision? Like we were struggling with this process. Yeah. yeah. Do you? I can definitely respond, but I have I have observations, but I think it's good to hear from you. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> Jessica, right? Um. Yes. So, so yeah, it, it's essentially how do we organize, motivate people who are so busy um, with with their lives um, and not necessarily interested in coming to a meeting. To me, we we have to meet people where they are. Um, at any given moment and the most effective way of reaching out to people and getting them involved is to start by asking questions rather than going to someone's door and just saying vote for this candidate um, or, or even like volunteer for this candidate asking like how do you feel about your health care like do you have kids what is your life like what are things that are bothering you um, what are things that you want to see change um, you know, what would make your life better? What are things that you care about? And starting from there, because I mean, and, and one thing that, you know, it, it definitely depends on what you're, you're seeking to do, what you're organizing around, but um, state policy really affects 
people's lives in profound ways, all of our lives. Um, and I don't just say that because I'm a state senator, like it's, it's actually, it's remarkable um, how many things, I think that there's a natural focus often on the federal level, sometimes on like the hyper-local level, um, but people aren't always thinking about how state policy affects their lives. And, and it's like, perhaps the most, in, in the most impactful, visible ways um, uh, that policy affects us is through state policy in New York. Um, and so, yeah, I think starting from what people care about and then talking about how um, participating in electoral politics actually is a means of changing those things, or, or it can be um, if, if we do it right. Um, so that that's how that's been my experience with it, you know, and literally knocking on people's doors and asking, beginning by asking about them rather than telling them about myself or our campaign. I'll just add that um, the so the office in the year that I was there, you were figuring out kind of how to structure an office in this very hierarchical governmental system where you were able to apply organizing ideas and understandings of how to run the office. And there was a tension there, right? But, but one of the nice things for me is that I got to spend a lot of time in the district office um, with the staff who were, off, many of them were coming from organizing backgrounds and were bringing the principles of organizing into the way that they were operating as a government office. And so one example for me that, that really struck me in line with that um, is in this concept of, of deep organizing, which in the book, Ramon, who's one of the staffers, uh, talks about and explains at greater length. Um, but this principle that it's not just about getting people to show up for a very specific legislation for a specific protest and then go back to their lives, that it's about giving people the tools so that they can take control of their own experience, right? Um, one of the things that happened, there were many things that happened over the course of the year. Um, and one of them is that there was some interest within the community of talking about metal detectors in the public school system. Um, this is something that came out of conversations with students and with, uh, it was brought to the office by the New York Civil Liberties Union, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and students who were organizing. Students, who, right. Yeah. So student organizers came to the office, came to the organizers uh, of your office who took a meeting with them. And it wasn't necessarily attached to legislation that was coming up soon, or even, I don't know that there was legislation at all drafted mm -hmm. around it, but this was something that the organizers found to be something worth their time to, to spend more time with the students. And what ended up happening is that they organized this town hall to have a conversation that was very well attended by stakeholders, by people who were students, parents, uh, people who were interacting with that school system to talk about the effects of having a metal detector in school. What are the psychological effects of walking through this? What is it actually doing? How much is it actually providing safety versus giving people this experience of being in an unsafe place? Um, for me, it was really meaningful to see it because it was about generating conversation. It was about meeting people where they were at, like you were saying, and, and it built something that had long-term effects potentially with this community rather than just trying to get people to show up for something that would you know, have a bill and a vote and then dissipate. Um, so that, that strategy was a really meaningful thing for me to see in action. I have one like, quick follow-up thought or you know, wondering if you two have made this connection with your work, because I do think like, you know, it goes through some of what you've been saying, which is that like, Part of what disempowers people a lot vis-a-vis -vis government is how opaque it is and how like hard to know. Like Sophia, you mentioned like state government, like who knows about that? And you know, and you mentioned how consequential it is, but how little people know about it. And I wonder, you know, it seems to me there are aspects in way both of your work that are designed to like empower people by making that somewhat less opaque, both in like how Julia you govern and how you approach like governing and also like the project of making a graphic novel, which I'm wondering if you thought about in terms of like popular education, like in sort of those terms and, and having a kind of political function. I'm just curious about, yeah, for both of you. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was really grateful to have the the amount of transparency in your office that you had with me and in general. It was a principle of the office to, to try and make these systems visible to folks. Um, and, and I was in line with that, um, which is great. And I, I think is surprising and not something that's necessarily to be expected from every government office that they really did just let me sit in any room that I wanted to be in. You know, we went to a lot of government meetings. Um, there was there was really never any question of like, is access going to be a problem? Um, which is dramatic. I mean, that's dramatic to say like, yes, warts and all, come in, let's see this. And and it really speaks to the way that you govern. Um, I can talk about this at, at any length, but I'll, um, for me, I think what was something I thought about a lot while I was making this book is how much information versus how much storytelling, because um, I'm sure as you maybe already are making projects or will make projects, um, it comes up a lot if you have sort of like a message or a mission or something you want to teach about how do you make it compelling and how important is getting all that information out versus getting people sort of engaged with that subject. Um, I really struggled with it because I wanted this to feel like an interesting read. I wanted it to feel dynamic. I wanted you to feel emotionally invested in the characters, which are me and you and the staff and the organizers. Um, I wanted to try and place you there in this emotional way. And ultimately for me, that felt more important than every detail, though I think if you have read it, you will see there, there is quite a lot of detail there because I also felt very accountable to trying to show some specifics of what it was that you all were working on. Um, so for me, that is that is more kind of what the considerations were rather than the government side of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that when I think about like popular education, it is actually so foundational to the work that I'm seeking to do, um, not just as a, a public servant, but particularly as um, a democratic socialist um, in in this role, um, that we would, it's it's actually only through popular education, like this this concept that everyone has um, has knowledge through their experiences um, and the ability to participate um, in our like mutual edification and education. Um, of one another, and you know, learn from one another, and create change that way. Um, it's it's the only way that we see change in in and through um, empowering, or rather, in in and through communities um, like the the majority of people in New York and and. Um, our communities in in Bushwick, in Cypress Hills, in East New York. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just been totally, totally foundational to the, the work that that I do, and I feel grateful that um, I I had could bring that in, like the organizing education that I had before um, before running for office, before becoming a senator. Bringing that into our office has been like. Not even just meaningful and nice, but absolutely essential. Um, that we we couldn't possibly do things the way that that they've been done in the past. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's what makes it's what gives this work meaning. That we um, are seeking, that I am seeking, that we are seeking um, to like observe and learn from everyday people and have their experiences and needs informing public policy rather than you know and it's not necessarily either or but but in some ways it is rather than like think tanks um or um you know so-called policy experts um just dictating you know this is this is what the law should be um 
and this is what this is what we should do to create change, right? Without um, without really believing or considering that all of us have an essential role to play. It really is like each and every one of us has a responsibility um, to create the world that we want to see. If that was too <laughs> vague. Very well but, said. Yeah. 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 For myself, the earth? Yeah. Um, so I guess I was wondering, like, for me, I'm from Arkansas originally, and like there, like, Democrat in itself is a dirty word, but I'm like socialist. <laughs> and like, I kind of want to know, like, why that label, even though it, it's quite uh, polarized and, and radical, why that was important to you to have like, on your campaign, or like on the, the cover of your graphic novel, like, have a question for both of you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how to put this gently, but I, I'm, you know, I wouldn't have done this if I were in Arkansas. To, to be, I wouldn't have, at least not in this way, like the project would have looked very different. Um, even though it is, it is absolutely worthy to um, engage in, in politics um, and like grassroots movements wherever we are. Um, but I think it would have looked different. Um, and we, you know, part of meeting people where they're at um, is using language that people can relate to. And when I say understand, I don't mean intellectually, right? I mean like that they can relate to. Um, and that is not, that doesn't mean something else to them than it means to us. Um, and I'll be honest, like, it's not as though I approach every single person in my district um, and say like, hi, I'm Julia Salazar and I'm a democratic socialist because not every single person is going to, that's not necessarily going to be meaningful to them. Like, right, we're, we're honest about who we are, but like, you know, I, I, yeah, I guess like the message does matter um, in our ability to connect with one another and, and our ability to connect with one another is infinitely more important than the labels that we, that we put on things. But the reason it was important to me in my district is because I, you know, living in my neighborhood, even though I haven't lived there, you know, my whole life, um, I have gotten to know and organized in, had even, you know, before running, organized in my community. Um, and I knew that like the politics that I have as a, as a socialist, um, as a democratic socialist, um, were shared and like popular in in our community, right? Um, but yeah, I think like in another in another place and time, um, what's most important is authentically connecting with people in a way that resonates for them and that is empowering for people, rather than saying like you have to use you have to call yourself a socialist. Um, and like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's very, it wasn't very eloquent, I'm sorry, but. Um, no, it is, it's a, yeah. and it's a good question. And, and it's something that I thought about a lot with the title and honestly, I still go back and forth on it. I was in Arkansas um, with the book. I went in October for, for a literary festival and you know, you're know, you here for the office and, and this book, my hope is that it, it reaches beyond New York and it, and it has. Um, but I went to a, a library conference before I was in Arkansas. I went to a, a conference of librarians with this book. This was in June. And uh, there were librarians there who told me I'm interested in this, but if I get this in my library, I'm putting my job in jeopardy. Um, it was important to me, the, the title, the interest for me in the title is that um, for one thing, this is part of the picture of you when I was initially interested in the campaign, it was part of it was this question of like, what does it actually mean to be a socialist senator? What does it mean to govern as a socialist? What does that actually practically look like? Um, and that was an important component of what that was. Um, the other thing that that my hope in this title 
in terms of what it does is that there's a there's a passage in the book from your in district inauguration, which is pretty early in your um, your first session, where you talk at length about the word radical and what does it mean and what is that actually in pra is it do you want to be radical is it accurate to say these things are radical should we embrace this term um, and I, I think you know this this book spends a lot of time with you with the staff with the organizers who are doing the day-to-day -day work of what this means and so my hope is that if you come into this book being like, wow, what is it? So salacious, radical, socialist. By the end of it, this is a story of like, well-meaning people who care about each other and their district who are working really hard and like doing a lot of spreadsheets and like taking buses up to Albany. You know, it's like, is this a radical act? What does that actually mean? So the, the question of the, of the word and how to apply it is interesting to me. Um, that said, I know that it is an alienating term and, and to have it travel remains a question, right? I think it's it's a these words do matter, so it, it's 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 good to question it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a balance of um, of like challenging our our people um, and connecting with people um, and and communicating in a way that people can relate to. Um, but also like um, I think what you just said, Sophia, and to Theo's question, like. It, this is actually why, even though I, I know it might seem like this book is about me, it truly, it, and I'm not saying this with like false humility, it truly is not. Um, and and the success of, of um, really this as part of a movement um, would be impossible if it were about one person. Um, and I'm not the right person to run in another district. In fact, I would argue, and this is like not, a cool thing to say if you are a politician or an elected official, like, I don't think I should run in any other district, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I really don't. Um, not at another level of government, not in any other district. I have no, you know, like, I think that there are so many people who um, are leaders in their communities should be doing that. Um, and I should never run for office in Arkansas. And there are people who, you know, and, and I won't, but they're there. But also, you know, and I don't want to say like, people from here should run here, you know, um, I guess like, yeah, it's really about um, making sure that a campaign um, is actually informed by the people who you're seeking to represent. Yeah. I was just gonna, two minor points, when I was rereading it, Sophia, I did think like, oh, I should buy this for my dad. But like, I think it would be interesting to see what his reaction would be and it would maybe be humanizing. My dad is not a left wing person. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thought I have on a more somewhat humorous vein is there's like an interview in the 70s Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse, the philosopher, did with a, um, a British uh, philosopher, and it's like TV, the philosophers on TV, who knew? Um, but like the, the, the interviewer is going on and he's just like, well, you know, Mr. Marcuse, you're saying you have all these revisions to Marx and many ways you differ from him. So, it seems to me you know, I call yourself a Marxist. And Marcuse calmly says, because Marx was right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, yes, and I'm a Marxist, right? Like, <laughs> actually, and, and so it, to what Sophia said, it is also just about like, this is the person running, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, so that's part of it. But also, I mean, the other side of that is like, if, if the decision is, well, we shouldn't say that because that's a polarizing word, then we're lending power to the fear around it, right? It's not an accurate representation of what does this word actually mean, which was so much of, as I said, the, the project of this book to show, you know, in action what that looks like. So, so those yeah. are, yeah, the considerations there. Laura. Okay, so I think I read like the beginning started and I know I wanted to be a little bit into your process making the book. Yeah. Um so it might be I mean it might have been obvious that um Julia was the person to make it about but at the same time like there's um distinct questions come up about like am I writing the right story, am I choosing the right persons 
Mm -hmm. So I remember that at the beginning of the book, there were there seemed to be some pressure on Fatima and Julia. I think that Victor was when talking about what kind of candidate she was and how the journey of writing this book began. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if later in the book this question will like pop up again or yeah. But my question is like how was it to have the uncertainty of creating this narrative about a character that could have been on one side? Yeah, so there, there was, for me, as I said, we didn't know each other. Um, and I also had not done this kind of project before, right? So I had all sorts of stresses around, like, what am I getting into? Who are these people, right? Like, what will this actually be like? And, and how will I create a story? I, I had no sense of, is this going to be a compelling story? I had no sense, truly, I had no agenda about, like, how am I going to portray this? I hoped, you know, I was, I was not considering myself a democratic socialist at the time, but I was certainly intrigued by these ideas. I had some kind of discomfort around calling myself that, so I hoped that these things would be elucidated through this process. But I really went into it with a lot of skepticism because, as I said, I, I knew about the campaign from media and not all of it was flattering. And, and so the questions of what it would be like and how I would feel were a big part of, especially the early parts of this of this journey for me. Um, that's also a part of why I wanted it to be independent. Not that I can imagine doing this project if I hadn't had creative control. I mean, that was that was something that was, was always important to me and it was something we agreed on immediately. Um, and I hope what comes through in the book is if you keep reading it is that for me, it was about just, just spending time with you, with the staff and, and making my conclusions from seeing this work play out. Um, so so that's that's how I went into it. Um, and and I also because this the campaign was that of a movement, right? This, the, the bill of it is that Julia was representing the movement behind her. So I was really curious about like this is also in the book for a moment like, what, what role does the individual play there, right? And, and, and how much am I going to be considering like personality and like individuals or should I just be like broadening the scope to just be about movement at large, right? So all of that was at play both as I was experiencing the year and as I was shaping it later. Um, I hope that you'll keep reading. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't wanna give too much away, but, but the short, version of it is just that I I was there on the ground and I saw the way that this the legislative office committed to their work, the way that Julia legislates, the way that she works in her community. And so that was much more important to me than any like given article that I read um, in the very beginning of the process. Questions? Bob? Yeah, keep it. If we achieve what we wanted and what our goals are moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, well, mine might be smaller, so maybe I'll <laughs> I don't know. I mean, in terms of the book, it's, I think it's actually geared more toward you because I didn't quite, you know, I was just like a passive participant in some ways in the book. But yeah. do you mean if, for, for me, what I achieved with the book and for Julia, what she achieved with running for office? Yeah. Got it, got it. Um, 
I think it, yes, I think it achieved what I wanted, which was that I hope this book provides some insight that is honest and that reaches people who are not already politicos, who are not already necessarily deeply involved in organizing, um, who are curious about what it means to civically engage. Those were the people I was hoping to reach. Um, and that what I like about books is that you can take it at your own pace. It gets to be this sort of private relationship that's removed from kind of social pressures, right? So in terms of educating yourself, I, I hope that it offers a mode of that that is compelling because there are characters, but also has information through this experience that I'm trying to bring to you about what these things look like, organizing, government, politics, in this sphere in the leftist space. Um, and I think that it does do that. <laughs> um, it's been really nice for me since it's come out to be able to, as I said, travel a little bit and go to different festivals, to different states, um, book festivals, comics festivals, um, to talk to people who both were lived through it, like Jeremy, who are in the district, who recognize people they know or legislation they're familiar with, and people outside of that and to, to hear feedback about about how accessible they felt that it was. Um, so yeah, I think I, I'm, I feel good about that. Um, and as far as what comes next, I, I hope to continue doing this kind of work. You know, I think um, marrying the, the skills that I have, which I think in this case is um, visual communication, that that will continue to be at play in terms of, of bringing meaning into the world in various ways um, and, and telling stories in that way. How about you? Yeah. Um, I feel like I have two different answers to your question. Um, and one is um, I, you know, you know, set out to run. We won the election, right? By by some objective metrics, we saw have, I've seen like success, right? Um, but there is so much more, like an infinite amount more that needs to be done to make our world better, to make people's lives better. Um, so, like, yeah, there's there's much more ahead of us. Um, for just one just one example, um, and it, it is talked about in the book. One of the first bills that I introduced was a bill called the Good Cause Eviction Bill. Um, and we talk about it a lot in the book. Um, I am still fighting to pass this legislation four years later, which is pretty common. There are some bills that take many, like even much longer to, to pass, even though certainly for those of us fighting for them, it, it feels and is really urgent for the people who would be impacted by it. Um, in, in this case, like the Good Cause Eviction Bill would make sure that people cannot be evicted without good cause. Like, what a novel concept. But in New York, the vast majority of people, um, in fact, probably most of us, not to scare anyone, but like, do, are not entitled to continue, if, if you're a renter, are not entitled to continue living where you live. Um, and, and like have this precarity and lack of, lack of real housing security. Um, and that's a, so that's something that like we were able to address in part in 2019 um, and saw like this incredible success through the 2019 rent laws. Um, but we have, we have a lot, just like so much work cut out for us and, and for me in my role. Um, I'll also say in terms of the book, like even though this this book in some ways it was like something that happened to me um it you know obviously it wasn't my idea it was sophia's and her creativity um and her her art and her writing um, and her coming to me and really what was expected of me was to say i mean i don't know if she expected it but but like you know was to say yes um and to give her or allow her to take full creative control and to be transparent with her um, like when she says she like she truly was embedded with our team and um, and spent a, a ton of time with me personally um, and that was also really important to me having you know when when I met Sophia the campaign had just ended and um, I had just come out of this campaign where as someone who has who's again like introverted 
um, uh, and everything that kind of comes with that, I guess, socially, um, I saw so much in my campaign, like total strangers in the press, whatever, um, writing things about me that weren't true. And that was really hard to, to see in print um, and to have like, or at least felt that I had little agency to, to change it. Um, things that weren't true and then other things that were so incomplete that they may as well have been like totally dishonest. Um, and so, yeah, to, to come from that and then um, have this opportunity for somebody to like get to know me and witness my life in like a pretty intimate way and the lives of my um, staff um, and the movement that we're a part of, that was, that was like really unexpected, but something, I guess you could say it, it is like a success in this, um, that, you know, just having this opportunity um, and being able to, to like be transparent and, and open um, and have you write this. Yeah. Can you just say a tiny bit more about why a bill like Good Cause might take as long as it does and mm -hmm. like what the opposition is that you've encountered and what it means to try and move something like that? Yeah, definitely. And Sophia writes about this, observes it a lot in the book. Um, so the real estate industry is just the most, I, I feel I can say it is the most powerful lobby in New York State. And it has been for longer than any, much longer than like any of us have been alive, like, you know, over a hundred years um, at least. <laughs> um, and um, what, what that really means is like, there is just so much power in this extremely lucrative industry in New York um, that dictate directly like writes the law um, sometimes and or has historically um, it's changing um, it's changing because everyday people are, are organizing and gaining power um, and and even getting elected um, and and then writing the law <laughs> changing the law um, but yeah and and part of the power that they have is by donating you know enormous sums of money to political candidates essentially buying elected officials um and uh with a bill like good cause it would gosh like it's not it's so it's not universal rent control um because it, it, that would violate the state constitution and we wouldn't be able to legally do it um but it is the closest thing um that we can do to providing like completely universal, truly the right for people to stay in their homes um, and to, you know, like to codify housing as a human right in, in the law. Um, and so that's why it's considered sort of radical. It was new when we, you know, brand new when we introduced it in 2019, whereas some of the other bills that we were fighting for housing related bills, um, all of them actually, um, had, a, had a legislative history. Um, and so that's another thing in Albany, change is slow, uh, unfortunately, often, um, even though the needs are urgent. And um, yeah, and so uh, these are the things that are unique about the Good Cause Eviction Bill, both like the vast impact statewide um, that it would have if it were law, and um, just like sort of the novelty of the idea and the power of, of the enemy, <laughs> the enemy. <laughs> you know, it sounds dramatic, but it's just reality. Like they, they really hate the bill, <laughs> the real estate industry, because um, it like threatens their ability to raise the rent as high as they want, um, right? It would, it would not cap rent increases technically, but it would provide um, this assumption against eviction if a landlord seeks to raise the rent by an unreasonable amount, which is, you know, defined in, in the the bill in the law. Um, I don't want to get too wonky, but some of my friends just read Carl Schmidt today, so they know friends, enemies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <Excellent. laughs> at least. Um, uh, Laura. Uh, I wanted to make another question and also like. Clarify and deal with the aggressive with my previous question. I just wanted to see if maybe you would try to explain or give an explanation to the claim 
things that were made in the press, but it's okay, it's not relevant. I'm glad that it was you and not uh, Kaum, Kaum, who mm. won. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad, especially because I'm, I'm from Colombia, so I, I, I find it very inspiring. And my last name is also Salazar. Oh, <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> Uh, so I was thinking about like um, following up again with Cuban's question of like what are your future plans after all this experience. I was wondering if it ever came up. Um, and I know you said that you don't want to keep like um, I don't know be elected for something else. But I was wondering if it came up. Uh, if the fact came up that uh, you may be uh, I don't know. Um, um, take all this knowledge that you have from colleagues in your in the US and maybe uh, take it to your own parents country in Colombia. I don't know if there is have been like a discussion maybe with your family, like, oh, why are you doing a lot of Colombia and changes politics and corruption? I am just wondering if you have taken into account um taking yeah. into account yeah, yeah, that's cool. I have there's so much I could say, and I'm gonna try to like limit, limit it because there's a lot I could say about this. But um, where where in Colombia is your family from? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. So my family's from Bogota, mostly oh. a little bit, a little bit spread out, but but like mostly Bogota. Um, I went to Medellin for the first time in 2019, actually. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, on a trip with with um, Catalina Cruz, who's from Medellin. Oh. She's in the assembly. Um, so, uh, at any rate, so the vast majority of my family, um, lives, still lives in Colombia. My father immigrated, um, before I was born, um, and, uh, met my mom who is not from Colombia. She's Italian and she's from, she grew up between like New Jersey and New York. My parents actually met in New York. Um, and they went to my father back to Colombia, but to my mom, you know, moved to Colombia. Um, again, before I was born and got married there. Um, and I was born in Miami, um, in South Florida. Um, so was my older brother, who's two years older than me. Um, but we spent a lot of time in Colombia when I was a child. Um, and and continue to, like, I go every two years, every, every couple of years at least. Um, it's harder now with my job than it used to be. Um, but yeah, um, Colombia means a lot to me. It um, because of my politics and also, you know, that most of my family still lives there. It's been incredible to see the change in power um, with Gustavo Petro's ad administration. Um, you know, we could talk about that for a long time. I know like it's not, it, it's not like perfect, <laughs> but it is, um, I never thought we would see someone who like self identifies as a socialist and has the really truly radical history and experience that um, Colombia's new current president has. Um, so I think like, at the same time, like the social movements in Colombia don't belong to me um, because I was, have, you know, grown up in the United States, um, even though it's like important to me and like I, I watch it closely, um, it impacts my family profoundly. Um, so, I don't think I have any political future in, in Colombia, <laughs> right? But um, but it's like, I do, like internationalism, um, this international movement is, is, so, is so powerful, right? Um, and, um, and that's, I think, the connection. Um, it, I did, you know, when I went in 2019 with Assemblymember Cruz, um, we went with actually two other Colombian American um, legislators as well, um, and the purpose of it was to learn from um, from people there who are working on like doing climate justice work, um, especially um, indigenous communities, and try to learn from them. Um, I think we really learned much more from them than we were able to to like bring from New York, um, especially because we were really new legislators at the time. But probably perhaps that would still be the case. Um, but yeah, uh, anyway, I could talk about Colombia for a, a while, but I, it's kind of, I know it's like kind of alienating. Um, gosh, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
So no political future in Colombia um, <laughs> for me. <laughs> but um, and like I don't have conventional political ambitions here either, right? Um, like I, I mentioned, I, I don't want to run for higher office, and it's not because I'm like not ambitious or and I don't care. I don't think it's important, but because like I. I really want to remain grounded and focused on this idea that it, it's kind of unique in the United States that there's so much emphasis on the individual, on the person, more than on a movement. Um, and that has to do with our party, our political parties, right? Like they're not real political parties. <laughs> like, like, you know, like how many of you are really like being, whatever your your party registration is like it's like really part of your identity yeah <laughs> so like you know what I'm saying? like like and it, that's the same for me and i'm literally like a registered democrat who runs on the democratic party line also the working families party line but like you know not it's just like the way our parties are set up in the united states um they are um it's kind of like you know the lesser of two evils and people don't feel really um like motivated by by that um but and and so we're more motivated by like voting for an individual um there's other reasons for it too you know we could go on and on about that but yeah um anyway uh i just see a, a, like a future in public service and public policy um uh i think other people in the political world would say it's kind of backwards that like my aspirations are to probably be someone's like legislative director, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when when the voters eventually stop electing me <laughs> to the state Senate. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've technically been in really for like four years. I was elected in 2018, but came in in 2019. And that's a that's a really short period of time to create the change that we want to see. So for now, I'm, I do want to stay in the state Senate and keep running. Um, and two years is very short, so I have to run like all the time <laughs> um, in order to continue to do this job. But um, when I'm no longer doing it, um, I think I, I'm still going to really want to do public policy because I see the, the impact and the positive impact that it has on people's lives. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so I wasn't aware of this book existed until today. I had an email and it would be interesting, so I'm definitely going to check it out. Um, really, I really admire how you entered more mainstream politics. So there's some saying about the best leaders not really having a desire to lead or this ambition for power or whatever. So now that you're on the inside, so to speak, do you see there being any, any sort of transition to more individuals entering politics the way you have? Um, Kind of what you're saying about the parties, do you think like your title as a democratic socialist, do you see there being a, a, a dissolution of the two-party system? Potentially, how could we move towards more options for everybody? And then uh, for Sophia, uh, as young artists, what advice would you have to us uh, to create more political meaning in the far right? Yeah. Do you want to start? Because I've been talking a lot. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I touched on this a little about how much overt political content, you know, with this book, I wanted it to be informative. And the, the shape that it took was to have that kind of educational purpose be pretty obvious in it. It is a story, but it will tell you a lot through the action of the story about government, about organizing. Um, I don't think that all of my work will have that overt, like a mission statement. Um, and I think that that's okay. I think over the course of this project, um, though that continues to be something that I see as a, a real power that people working in visual and narrative media have, which is that we have this tool of communication that, that potentially people can access from so many different ways and they might get their information in other ways. Um, that there's also real value in joy and in connection and that making work that is not expressly like the hammer of 
here is how to do something like that that there's also real value in that you know beyond this book a lot of the the work that i do is humor work i think i really especially in my earlier career i was like well that's not meaningful work that's sort of what led me to this project in the first place was i want my work to be meaningful i, I want to engage with my interests and my politics in the, the work that i'm doing i still feel that that's true i think i also have over the course of this come to appreciate in part through community organizers for whom if some of you i'm sure have been a part of organizing efforts um, that joy is also like such an integral part of that experience right like if it's miserable to be doing this organizing work you're less likely to show up again right like having a component of joy being a part of your work is also really valuable so so I want to say that all of those things can be a part of the mix and that making work that is beautiful, that moves people, um, that moves you, that, that don't underestimate that aspect as well. Um, I think I am learning how to like trust myself and, and the people that I'm speaking to, that I don't need to think about like, how can I, I have this pill, which is my message of how can I like put peanut butter on it by making an interesting story. I think that we are all invested in one another um, and, and accessing that through many different kinds of art is possible um, and, and that your audience is smarter than, you can, you can think of them as being intelligent. You don't need to think about like, how do I like trick them into learning about politics, right? They will learn if they want to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. So oh, I, I think there was still. Oh, we'll respond quickly, questions. and then and then and then um, take your question too. Um, yeah. So so like, have I seen more people, um, like everyday people enter politics? Yeah, actually, it's been very cool to see in in the year that I was elected. Actually, I came in with like a, a class of people into the state senate who um, are really progressive, not conventional candidates, including um, some who rejected. Um, real estate money the same way that, that I did and, and do. Um, and like, that was really inspiring for a lot of people. And I think like we've largely continued to see that like civic engagement. Um, people, you know, are, are up in Albany, um, lo like when I say lobbying, I mean like advocating, like every everyday people, not like professional lobbyists necessarily, but um, everyday people coming to the Capitol and like demanding that we do right by them, um, and that that's very cool, um, and and just like an important development um, for for us as a society um, in our state politically. Um, I've also seen like I, when I was elected, I was the youngest woman who had ever been elected to the state senate, um, and now that's just changed actually. And it's we're like very similar in a lot of funny ways, but um, I campaigned for. Um, someone named Kristen Gonzalez, who ran um, actually due to the redistricting process in um, some of the neighborhoods that I currently and had represented, um, but also in uh, Queens and Manhattan, um, ran uh, also as a democratic socialist from our same political organization, the DSA. Um, and, and like she ran as a 27 year old woman was younger than I was when I was elected. And so now she's the youngest member. Um, and so like to see, it's not just like, oh, new youngest member, but like it's meaningful to see um, that continue, that it wasn't just like a fluke or one person in, in myself um, or one class of people, but it's, it's really been growing. Um, and uh, I think um, every year, you know, every day, more people who have, typically been excluded from the halls of power, whether it's young people, black and brown people, um, you know, queer people, sex workers, like you name, like people who just have been marginalized and, and excluded from the halls of power are now, are now um, personally, um, you know, either participating in, in politics in a powerful way or, or even like getting elected. Um, and uh, gosh, I could talk for a long time about how we need to like, completely dismantled the two party system. Um, but I, I think that um, building a movement that is like 
not actually in any meaningful way part of the Democratic Party. Like I mentioned how like I run in the Democratic Party line because and and on the Working Families Party line, because in New York State, that's like the way that you, if, if you don't, then, you know, historically, I would say you won't get elected. Right. Um, and uh, which is really unfortunate. Um, but even as we like nominally are part of the party, we're really not. And we're building this movement for, for me, it's through the DSA um, that is completely independent of and actually like rejects the institution of the Democratic Party and building it and building it so that we um, you know, won't rely on the two party system anymore. And there are even people who are not, who maybe they're not democratic socialists or maybe they're just not like really engaged in politics in the same way, but they're very rightly disillusioned with both of the major political parties. Um, and they are like eager to build something beyond it. So I'm hopeful. I think it, it'll take time, but unfortunately, <laughs> but but I'm seeing progress toward that. Sorry. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks. Excellency, I just have a question in the system that we believe in is a basic in the subject about uh, the industry of real estate that you talk about, people have a choice to rent any real estate um, component of the real estate intensity of each location. Will they increase the increase of the, the rent or try to evict both the politics? Um, like, so I'm someone who sees my role, um, certainly because of my political orientation as a socialist, but, but also just as someone who's in government, it's funny. So like, you know, I have, of course, Republican colleagues and people who have very different ideology than I do. And I often am wondering like why they are in government because they seem to like really hate government so much and think that like government should have nothing to do with people's lives, you know, um, which is not, you know, that uncommon in like this society and, and like in a capitalist system it's like as you as you said laissez-faire um even though as as you know there is regulation in in our system but uh but largely like industry um it's it's not, I, I certainly don't think it's sufficiently regulated right <laughs> clearly um and yeah and so like i personally think like there, so there, there are other ways for us to create change, but in my role, I naturally am really focused on how we can create change, like through the through the government. Um, and even though, again, like it's not the only way for us to create change in our society, um, and so, like that, in that way, um, I want to see the housing industry regulated, like actually regulated um, and the regulations enforced. Um, and so like right now, a really, really in, in the scheme of things, like in the context of our city and our state, very few people live in regulated housing. We have public housing, we have rent stabilized housing, um, but, but it's like not actually a lot. Um, and most of us live in housing that's totally unregulated. And that's exactly why um, I introduced and, and am fighting for, along with this, you know, coalition of people all over the state fighting to pass the good cause eviction bill, um, because it would, um, without, you know, it, it's, 
one of the things that we run into all the time is like our state constitution, our, our federal constitution, um, uh, that like we cannot just take, we can't just expropriate landlords, even though I personally think we should, <laughs> um, you know, but, but like we can't legally. Um, and so, well, what can we do? We can bring um, strong regulations to, to the market um, and like to these transactions, right? The transaction, like the transactional relationship of having to, to rent from a property owner um, that you, it won't just be laissez-faire, like, you know, there's nothing you can do. The property owner has all of the power and can just kick you out, but rather um, that, you know, ideally all housing would be regulated. Like, you know, it's, it's housing. <laughs> this is like, a, it sounds so crazy to a lot of people who I work with every day. Um, but I don't think it's crazy. I think like it's totally reasonable. Um, and, uh, yeah, I could go on and on about it, but, but, um, yeah, like that's exactly what, what motivates me, um, not just in housing policy, but in other areas of policy, like we, we um, can't just, it's barbaric really to, to just leave things the way they are and not intervene is, is the way I feel, you know? I think that might be a good note to end on. <laughs> so, uh, really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Sophia, um, so much. Um, just brief announcement uh, time, which is, uh, our last two lectures of the semester. Um, the next one is March the 20th. And we have Alex Kitnick, who's a uh, art historian uh, at Bard, coming to talk about what is normal art. Um, I literally don't know the answer to that question, so I'm curious what I'll have to say. Um, and the second uh, final event of the season is on April the 10th. Um, we have an organizer and also a, a theater uh, artist from uh, who's worked for many years in Appalachia and the coal fields there, has just come out with a two volume series of uh, political plays from uh, organizing there and in the Bronx. Um, and so the books are just coming out. He's gonna be joined by a community organizer, a theater artist from the Bronx as well. Um, so it should be very cool. That's April 10th, come on to that. Uh, everyone, let's give one more thank you.